Well, thank you very much, I say, for um, seeing me today. Um, obviously, we're talking about um, the committee that your kind of inquiry was yeah, yeah. referred to it as. Um, how did it, it come about, and who decided what the, the remit of the group was? Yeah, okay, well, um, it's intended to provide input to the government's negotiating position. Um, I was commissioned by Lord Newby, um, Liberal Democrat leader, uh, to look in particular at the construction industry yeah. because of my background and uh, other members of the House of Lords, also Liberal Democrats, are looking at other sectors of the economy. Um, I mean, for instance, the uh, financial services, um, and uh, for instance, the, uh, the electronic and communications media, uh, and so on. Yeah. Um, but my remit is specifically the construction sector, and um, the intention is to do, um, well, to replace emotion and anger with some facts and figures. Um, because, uh, I mean, it, I'm somebody who thinks it's been a, a serious setback for the UK to be leaving the EU, but saying that doesn't cut any ice. The, the, the question is, what is actually going to be the impact? What are the things which need to be safeguarded against or protected? And what are the opportunities as well? Um, and that's exactly what I've been doing over the last um, two and a half months months now, um, with a view to um, having a report um, which is ready to be used in the debates on Article 50, um, which we now expect to be at the end of February and uh, the beginning of March, as far as the House of Lords is concerned, and obviously beyond that, to pursue those arguments in terms of holding the government to account subsequently. Okay. That's, that's very interesting. I think certainly from the those that are not directly involved with the Westminster processes, it seems very quick. It seems to be quite a quick process to get from a bill all the way through to, to triggering Article 50. How much of a say will the Lords actually get and what effect can they have on, on the transition of the bill? Um, well, the first thing to say is we're in completely uncharted territory, yeah. so it's sort of anybody's guess. Mm. The government is quite clear it wants to have the business done by the 31st of March, uh, because that is the Prime Minister's commitment to trigger Article 50, which you won't be able to do unless both Houses of Parliament have agreed identical wording on the legislation which, which works for her. Um, the government obviously wants the shortest, quickest, neatest bill that it can get, and uh, those of us who are concerned that the negotiators should not go off um, completely, uh, well, with blank sheets of paper, um, are very committed to making sure that things are introduced into that debate and hopefully into the bill to make sure that the negotiation proceeds in a, in a way that's more favourable to the United Kingdom kingdom at the end of the process than it would otherwise be. And in my specific case, more favourable to the construction industry than it would otherwise be. In, in, in terms of that, um, do we have any idea of what the shape of this bill might actually look like? I mean, you said it's the shortest possible. Um, it, is there any indication at this stage as to... Well, they, they said on Tuesday that they would publish it within days, so we'll probably know by the end of this week. Um, I think they'll do their very best to get to get it on two sides of paper, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, from the construction industry's point of view, what can we do to get our voice heard above the various other groups, the bankers, the automobile industry? What, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what role can we take in, in getting that voice heard? Yeah, well, I certainly think there's a deficiency there yeah. at the moment. Uh, I mean, we've seen. Um, ministerial recognition of the special case of financial services, the special case of the car industry, even the special case of the agriculture industry, uh, with some kind of commitment that they will still be able to bring lettuce pickers in um, 
uh, regardless of, of anything else. But nobody, no minister has, as far as I can see, engaged with the construction industry to say what are the vital interests of that industry. So, I mean, what I'm doing and what other people are doing as well, uh, I'm not the only person with this thought in mind, is trying to make sure that when ministers go off to Brussels, they have got something written on their sheet of paper about the construction industry. Yep. Okay. And do you feel it, you, you said no, no minister has engaged with the construction industry. Is, is it for the construction industry to do better at engaging with a minister rather than a minister engaging with the construction industry? Which, which way round should it be? I mean, do you feel that the RIBA have been vocal enough in actually setting out, for example, what they would like to see for architects? Uh, well, I mean, the first thing to say is that the professional institutes um, combine to write a letter to the uh, to David Davis, the Secretary of State for Brexit, uh, back in September, uh, which was uh, and it's in the public domain, and I'm sure the AJ will have covered it. Uh, and it's I, I think it's got um, you know a reasonable amount of headline stuff uh, about what needs to happen. Um, uh, I'm I've actually had conversations with um, Andrew Forth at the RIBA and. Uh, he's sending me some more briefing stuff um, at the end of this week. I was talk uh, you know, I was emailing him just earlier on this week. Um, and um, I mean, it's really for the RIBA to say what contact they've had uh, with government. But the, the impression that I've got from quite a lot of different quarters uh, within the industry who are... And, at the level where they're quite used to interacting with government at one level or another, is that the message coming back to them is, well, we'll look, at, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk to you, but don't come bringing problems, come bringing solutions. Um, and it's there's a certain amount of um, la la laing by ministers, uh, you know, when anybody gets near them with a with a hard luck story. Okay. Um, in your opinion, what do you think? Good the... morning, my lord. Okay. Oh, yeah. Tea, coffee, um, water, okay. fizz. Okay. Well, coffee would be ideal. Coffee, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I'll have a coke, please. Sorry? Uh, a coke, coffee. please. A coke. Yes, please. Um, what, in your opinion, do you think the key things to, to actually get across actually are? What, what do you think the key issues are that will need to be agreed as a negotiating position? Well, I think the first thing the government's got to recognise is that uh, having a healthy, expanding construction industry is central to them delivering their infrastructure and housing agenda. I really don't think they've got that at the moment. Um, and um, so it isn't just special pleading by some hard-up blokes on a building site. Uh, it's, do you really want a million houses by 2020? Do you really want High Speed 2, Runway 3, Pinkley Point, uh, the biggest rail uh, infrastructure investment, etc.? The Northern Powerhouse, the Thames Tideway, Crossrail 2. It, and I mean, the, 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 the figuring that's come to me is that to deliver those on the time scale the government's talking about needs the construction industry to expand by about 35%. It's expand its capacity by about 35%. If it's a hard Brexit, it will shrink by 9%. You can ask where, where you're taking those figures from. Yeah, well, the 9% is the proportion of the construction industry labour force, which is from the EU27. And the 35% the, the is in the evidence that went to, um, it's again published evidence from one of the major contractors. I can give you a reference for that. Excellent, thank you very much. I mean, c construction as, as a general hates uncertainty and has particularly long lead times. Um, we, we spoke briefly there about um, construction putting across a special case but not just pleading it's it's yes, hard done yes. by. Um, given that construction has low margins and there's uncertainty in currency fluctuations and things yeah. of this kind, um, is there anything that can be done to, to assist in the transition of these large projects in the way that we've seen for agriculture or um, other special cases? Well, I, I guess the number one ask uh, is that the existing EU workforce needs to be given some security of tenure. 
um, because if they start to leave, um, driven either by uh, some real measures or by a perception, then the industry will start to slow down, particularly in London. I mean, 54% of the labour, of the construction labour force in London, is from the other, from the EU 27. Yeah. And there's some evidence I saw yesterday that Barrett has submitted. Um, thank you, Barrett. Uh, Barrett have submitted evidence to say that for their housing in London, 59% of their construction force is 20 is from the EU 27. Um, and if housing in London is yeah. one of the government's priorities, yeah. um, then retaining that labour force is important. And as you will know, of course, it's not that that labour force once here will just go on building houses in London. They, they are specific trades, specific, you know, employed for specific yeah. projects and so on. So that's not a fixed group of people, it's, it's rotating. And, and so if you have, you know, one could imagine the government saying, oh, all right, we'll give you anybody who's here, who was here on the 23rd of June can stay. Well, that's up to a point good, but it doesn't solve the problem because all the people are here for one or two years will go and are they going to be replaceable? Okay. Um, so it needs to be some, some form of ongoing agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it hasn't, it must not be, so... Yes, I mean, the... Um, I mean, Barrett's again made the point that as well as their 59% of um, EU 27 workers, 10% of their workforce are from other parts of the world. Um, and they made a point about you can only get that those workers from other parts of the world through the tier two visa system which is very cumbersome and long-winded and therefore they don't do it i mean it's if they've got a specialist that they really want um, then they will go to the trouble of doing it but the the, cons the evidence i've taken not just from, not from barrett specifically but from a wide range of contractors is that um, the palaver the problems of getting in people through the non-EU system is a major disincentive. Um, We've spoken there probably of some of the very large organisations, but th this is still true to um, the degree of the the SME side of stuff, and um, a lot of the smaller architectural practices. Um, if, if they're a team of four and they have one EU member, then you instantly you're looking at 25% yeah, yeah. of their staffing. Do, do you feel that it's still appropriate to look at that from the professional side as well as the, the delivery on the construction side, given that there's you know, seven years or more of training to actually get to, to be a qualified architect? Yeah, I do very much. I mean, the, there's the professional, the skilled and the unskilled sectors, and all of those rely on... Uh, workers from the EU 27. The RIBA have actually, uh, one of the things that Andrew Forth is due to provide me with is, is, the, is it in writing, but when we met he was telling me that 25% of architects employed in London are from the EU 27. Um, and I mean it's got a knock-on effect in another area which again the government ought to take notice of, which is quite a proportion of those are working in the major international practices which are delivering projects all over the world, uh, which in turn are levering in eight billion pounds a year of export earnings. Um, and you know, if Brexit is about setting ourselves free and increasing our trade and exports overseas, this is a sector which is successful. And if it loses a quarter of its design workforce, we'll soon be a lot less successful. And I mean, the argument over the, 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 the argument's got to be one at two levels. Level one is the government's got to believe it's important and understand what the problem is, and that's the battle I'm fighting at the moment. Level two is the government's got to go off and negotiate with Brussels, and that's not a trivial job either. But if we don't, I mean, in my experience of negotiation, and I've done a bit of it, if you don't know what you want when you start, you're very unlikely to get it.